Hello everyone, today I'm going to get sciencey on you and we're going to talk about the observer effect, the act of consciousness bringing into reality, which you do, thank you, on today's episode, the One Year Life Transformation Challenge. Hello everyone. As promised in the intro, today I'm going to talk about the observer effect, incredible scientific breakthrough that we've had in the last hundred years, sometimes known as the measurement problem. And it's great that science is really helping us understand the void, helping us understand presence, helping us understand nature. We reject all of this science. We're still teaching Euclidean and Newtonian science. It's four or five hundred years old in schools because it's better to sell things via that mechanism of science. However, the real deal science, quantum mechanics, which is the most accurate portrayal of reality that we've ever had in the history of man mankind, the maths works out, we know it to be legit, we know it to be real, is being hidden from us, and we're gonna talk about it today. We're gonna to talk about the ramifications of it. And personally for me, geez, quantum mechanics, in fact, the observer effect was huge. I come from a scientific background. And I always wanted answers. I always felt that, you know, you had these weirdos who were meditating, having it, I go, they can't have answers. They were sitting on a rock. What do they know? Science has the answers. And then the day that I fully appreciated quantum mechanics, I'm not going to say I understood it, and I'll explain that in a moment, appreciate it, all of a sudden I appreciate these blokes sitting on the rocks incredibly. Because what took a large hadron collider, millions of man hours, the most incredible maths in the world to come up with in the last hundred years, people effortlessly came up with 3,000 years ago. So, as always, I'm going to begin with a quote on the subject, and that quote is, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Niels Bohr, who's a hero of mine. I want to say that again. If quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Niels Bohr was just, just amazing, amazing human who looked into the reality of reality. And you know how when you go to school and you see that you've got protons um, and neutrons in the sort of core of an atom, you have these electrons floating around? You know that's BS, right? You know it doesn't exist. Maybe you don't. But you do now. It doesn't exist. And it never existed. It's a conceptualized drawing of someone who doesn't get it, which is the textbook. Niels Bohr's, um, who was probably one of the greatest scientists of all time, uh, understood the atom and gave us the current explanation of the atom. The atom is an infinite realm of possibilities, and it's a matrix, a matrix of probabilities and possibilities. It exists everywhere and in every place and every time. And once it is collapsed, it becomes solid, it becomes reality. So it's, it's, it's basically, it's not a thing. So when you see an atom with all these things spinning around, these electrons and these pretty little orbits that look like our planets, and remember humans do that quite often. We look around the world, the world around us and try and break that down into stories, you know, to help us understand the world better. There's no such thing as electrons spinning around an atom. It, it, that's not how it works. It was our conceptualization that does that. It's much more beautiful than that. It is a storybook that hasn't been written. That's the, that's the way I look at it, Adam. It's, it's, it's not there until you decide it's there. But I'll get into this a bit, uh, a bit deeper. So, as um, Max Planck and individuals became more aware of the atomic nature of things, Albert Einstein got involved and was the first person to calculate you know, how many atoms in 1905, I think it was, how many, you know, the size of an atom. We started to say, well, atoms seem like the fundamental building blocks of reality. Let's look at those and help us understand reality. But the closer we looked at these atoms, the more nervous we became because our beautiful structured world of you know, Newtonian physics where everything just worked, didn't work at the atomic level. And if everything was made of atoms and our understanding didn't work, we had to look at our understanding. So you had all these geniuses who, especially, this, we had this amazing collective consciousness shift around you know, 1895 to 1910 where people just went, when their heads exploded and they became smarter than we've ever become before from a perspective of looking at the atom. So you had Albert Einstein who was what was called a materialist. He believed the world was really there, definitely there, and we just had to go out and prove it. You had other people like Neil, Niels Bohr's who believed that the world wasn't really there, it was created through our brain. Einstein spent his entire life trying to prove the world was there, ultimately failing. Neil Bohr spent his entire life trying to prove the world wasn't there. <laughs> and where did, we, uh, where did we get to? Well, I think one of the most famous conversations ever in science was 
Einstein just had enough of quantum mechanics, basically, because it, it was, you know, he, he didn't like it. He, believed, he knew it was true, but he didn't like it. And when Neil Bohr would say, listen, Einstein, we don't know. It's all until a conscious observer collapses the waveform. We don't know what's going on. Um, it's a big gamble. And Einstein famously said at a conference, God does not play dice. Which, you know, is a pretty good statement, right? God does not play dice. I like that makes sense in our, you know, sort of intuitive nature, to which Neil Bohr's reply was, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. Boom, come back of the century, which is true. We make these books, we create this science, telling God what to do. God doesn't care. God doesn't know that we, that um, Isaac Newton said that, you know, we, that, that things move in a certain way. He doesn't know that, or she doesn't know that, or we don't know that, the collective doubt doesn't know. It just happens. So... What is the observer effect? Okay, so the observer effect is simple. Nothing's real until it's observed. Nothing exists until it's observed. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but it's the basic level of our scientific understanding of the world, is that when there is no conscious observer or awareness, there is no universe. The universe exists in relationships. There are only relationships, i.e. observer, universe. You take away one of them, there's nothing. Both of them go, because it's only a relationship. So. What are, what's our involvement in this? Well, we do something very interesting. We collapse the waveform. So, is light a wave or a particle? Well, it can behave both ways. We still have, you know, this is, we think we're so smart, we still have a few challenges ahead of us. So, reality is very simple. Imagine you've got a television, and you've just turned on your television, and it's all static. Now, that's actually not static. That's a heap of information being put onto your screen, but unrecognizable, because it's not tuned. And then we tune our TV in, and then we tune and the static becomes the tennis, for example, the tennis game. Now, what we've really done there is we've only refined the static to create the tennis game. We haven't created the tennis game. And that's how reality works, is that reality is all these infinite possibilities, one of them being tennis, and when we fine tune it, we get tennis. But what we instinctively know about a TV is that just because the tennis is on, we know that the basketball could be on another channel. So all these infinite realities are playing out at the same time, and all that matters is what the conscious observer tunes into. We know that when we tune into the tennis, that doesn't mean that everyone around the world just tuned into the tennis. We know that people can still be watching Seinfeld or Oprah. However, it was just us who tuned into that. And that's very much how reality worked. A great example of this was by um, Dobrovsky, who I've told this story before, but it's incredible. He, he, he had this, whether it was him or a dream, he, t he talks about it through a dream where a man who was disenchanted with life, bought a gun, you know, we're talking about Moscow, cold winter, puts the gun on the table, is ready to kill himself, but just before he does, he goes out to get a, just some fresh air. And as he does, a little girl grabs on his coat and says, please sir, can I have some, some, some food? And he looked at this beautiful girl who was obviously starving, but he was in a bad place, and like I say, if you feel bad, you do bad. And he sort of shoot her away, and as she shoot her away, he thought, geez, what, what a beautiful girl. And, you know, he did have some sympathy for her. Went back into the room to shoot himself, but just as he did, he thought to himself, I'm aware I'm a conscious observer. I'm aware of that girl. And if I kill this awareness, what happens to the girl? Because remember, it's a relationship between him and the girl. And if one of them goes, both of them goes. It's like having a mirror. You get rid of the mirror, your reflection's not there. You get rid of you, the reflection's not in your mirror. It's only a relationship. So how do we manifest destiny? How do we use the observer effect in our lives to help better collapse more interesting waveforms. How do we tune in to a better TV channel? If, you're t if the TV channel you've tuned into you don't like, how do we change the channel? Well, number one is to be present. It requires a conscious observer. <laughs> now, we're not always conscious. You know, sometimes we go into our heads and dream about things that have happened in the past. Being present, number one is being present and aware. That's the best way to create the observer effect. Number two, remove judgment. The minute you judge your creation, so for example, you tune into tennis and go, oh, this isn't very good. You've just made it not very good. Your sheer relationship of your judgment has now labeled that reality as either good or bad, and therefore it will conform to that. So for example, if you go, this is the worst tennis game, if you can imagine the tennis game getting worse and worse as the more you say that, is that's the reality you've tuned into. Number three, align with the way things are. Swimming with the current is much easier than swimming against the current, and there's a reason for that. The current was created by nature, it was current by you know, all these amazing you know, manifest forces, and you, your little ant, are trying to swim against it. Don't worry about it. Align yourself with the way things are. They will pass and they will manifest into what's your true reality. Number four, understand time is not linear. This is challenging, but the reality is Time is not linear. We've proven this scientifically. So what you expect in the future and what you hate about the past, 
it's just thought concepts. They don't exist like that. Tomorrow is not in front of you, and yesterday is not behind you. It's as, as obvious as that seems, that it is, that the, the future's in front of you. That's just the mind-made concept. You've been taught to believe that. Now, it's the only thing that's existed and will ever exist. In fact, the quanta of moment, the time that's encapsulated within this brief quanta of a moment that we're talking about, includes infinity. I know it's crazy, you're just gonna have to buy this one on me. Drop linear time, don't expect events to happen in the future or things that, that happen in the past, just be present. The observer effect has profoundly influenced me. It helped me understand all the religious texts I've ever looked at. I looked through the prism of quantum mechanics. You should feel really great about the fact that the things we're talking about are, uh, are understood and um, the, by the greatest minds in the world. We're not just talking about fluff. We're talking about the real deal Holyfield stuff that's in front of us right now. I'm so glad I got to talk to you about this subject. It's so important to me. I can't wait to see you tomorrow to observe and bring into reality this conscious nature that we have. Until then, goodbye. Mm -hmm.